Okay, so welcome. I am here with my friend and colleague, Maxine Fisher, and I'm so happy that she is here joining us today because I really adore her and she's got some really amazing things to share today. Maxine is passionate about empowering people to feel at home in their bodies. She takes a holistic approach to health and happiness with her roots in Tantra, herbalism, yoga, modern psychology, somatic theory, and transformational coaching. She's a so certified somatic sex educator and sexological body worker with much of the last 10 years spent working with individuals and couples. Her passion for her work comes from her own history of battling disembodiment. And she has a commitment to personal growth, healing, and supportive community, community building that has been the foundation of her practice. So I am so stoked to welcome you here. And I, yeah, I would love to talk a little bit more about maybe what somatic sex education is or sexological bodywork is to the people that are new to it. Um, I know that you and I have worked, we've worked together and we're colleagues in this field. So we know what kind of a little bit about it, but I, whenever I share like somatic sex education, they're like, sex is somatic sex education. What? Like, what is that? So maybe you could give a little bit of brief overview of what that is for people to, to hear about. Sure. Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Um, yeah, thank you for the intro. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a joy to be here. Uh, somatic sex education and sexological bodywork. So sexological bodywork was really kind of uh, where this modality started. And um, it began in San Francisco um, in the late 80s, I believe. And it was a modality that was... Um, Inclu it was touch inclusive, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it was really helping people to get back in touch with their sexuality in an empowered way um, that um, included one way client centered touch, essentially, as a way to repattern the body, to teach people about consent, to um, mm -hmm. help people move through uh, trauma and blockages that they might be holding in the body. And um, a lot of therapeutic modalities, like if we look at like counseling, if we, you know, if we look at other therapeutic modalities, they won't be touch inclusive. So this kind of really makes it stand out in a, in a unique way. Yeah. And um, yeah. And somatic sex education took the foundations of that and built on top of it and got really curious about, okay, what does it look like if we get even more focused on these pieces around like consent, if we get even more focused on these pieces around like how the nervous system works mm. and how we create um, a container for safety mm. in the body. So, I mean, a lot of the people that we're working with have experienced trauma so we want to make sure if we're doing touch inclusive work that it's incredibly trauma informed right. that we're moving at the pace of the body and you know the body's kind of learning zone essentially mm. um you know when we talk about trauma informed modalities we really uh we'll talk about you know we'll use terms like titration which essentially means like just kind of slowly you know really just like like drop by drop, really increasing our, our, our capacity to be able to um, experience sensation, you know, new sensation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love that. I love how the bridging of somatic sex education really allows for us to tap into our, as you're saying, like our body's learning zone, because I think our mind has a different idea of what sort of transformation or experience that it wants to experience in the body, but the body's mm -hmm. way of navigating its experiences is on a completely different functional level and requires a different attunement to really like acknowledge, okay, what's the actual pace that my body needs to go? Because there's certain experiences within the nervous system that feel like it's communicating at different speeds and in a different language than the mind sometimes can formulate. So like when we go into the body and we tune into that somatic awareness of, okay, what is my body feeling right now? And what is safety feel in my body, in my body? Because the mind can conceptually know what safety is and sometimes feel like, oh yeah, I'm safe here. Like this is home. But the body's experience with that on a cellular level might feel a little different depending on the noise in the environment or what sort of um, experiences we've had with our relationships and how that's imprinted and, 
stuck with and stayed within the nervous system. So I love that. I love that it's that part of the somatic sex education tuning into the body's wisdom with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's so beautifully said and really like a foundation when we talk about being in embodied sexuality um, and in embodied connection, really that starts with creating safety in our bodies, like feeling grounded, feeling safe and feeling aware of what's happening in our bodies, where that yes and that no Mm. are. And that really begins with understanding yeah, just that being able to notice mm-hmm. as we're moving back and forth, you know, in our nervous system from survival response into that state of safety. Yeah. And so in my practice, that's really where our work begins right. is, um, is first creating that, that grounded sense of safety in the body and then building from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You mentioned around the body's yeses and nos, and I'm curious on how someone would be able to understand that a little bit more deeper of what that means for them and their body and how they could tune into more clarity around that for themselves? Mm, Wow, that's an awesome question. Yeah, well, part of this, part of this work is we're helping two people to develop a little bit more of like a somatic awareness. So um, really being able to like tune into those cues that our body is giving us. And our our autonomic nervous system connects to our digestive system. It connects to our heart rate. You know, it connects to um, the rate that we're breathing. Mm. So as we shift into a little bit of a state of kind of like, we feel a little bit of like freeze or a little bit of shock, you know, we're going to get a lot of cues. Things are going to kind of change in our body. And as we develop our awareness of this, um, you know, our awareness, like our somatic awareness, we'll begin to feel these cues more and more. We might feel a fluttering Mm. in our stomach, you know, and kind of over time, begin to develop an awareness that this is like a sign that we actually feel uncomfortable Mm. or we might feel a warmth in our chest, Mm. you know, and be able to kind of recognize this as a cue that we feel quite connected or safe. Mm. over time and um you know we can really kind of look at these as like cues from our subconscious it's rather than our conscious mind deciding what it is we want in the present moment this is our more subconscious mind coming through and saying hey no actually this is what's really going on this is how i feel and this is um something that i want listened to yeah yeah definitely Do you feel like when the subconscious is speaking through the body in that way, like that speaks, that speaking through the nervous system, like how, how is the nervous system involved with that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the nervous system really responds to cues if we feel Mm. safe or unsafe. Mm. So if something is kind of going on at the back of our mind, you know, we, we have something called neuroception. So that's like, that is how our our nervous system kind of picks up on subtle cues from another person that they are a safe person or whether they're showing signs of safety through their actions. And our conscious mind might not always pick up on these cues. Mm. So if you are, you know, if the tone of your voice is going very flat while you're talking to me, or you're not showing signs that you're engaged with what I'm saying, my nervous system is going to pick up on subtle signs of unsafety and this is this is kind of this is like a this is like a subconscious reading of our interaction that might go on um beyond what my conscious mind is interpreting yeah and so i will feel that in my body but i might not necessarily be able to describe why oh interesting yeah yeah that's super interesting because yeah it's almost like in a way, I would almost attune that to it being like part of our energetics or a part of our energetic body, a way that our nervous system sort of picks up on the resonance fields around us based off of what someone's, maybe their posture or how the sounds of their voice or maybe um, the way that they're walking towards me. It's like there's this feeling that our, the nervous system in the energy body picks up on like, oh, I, I interpret this as safe or not safe. And depending on how my body's nervous system and the auric field that I'm resonating with tunes into that like if it doesn't feel safe to me then that will trigger something within my nervous system that I won't be able to completely understand like 
why do my why do I feel like my heart rate increasing or why do I feel like a twisting in my stomach or why do I feel this pulling sensation in my gut like it's almost like these cues of the subconscious are speaking like from this primal primordial place of our subconscious and there's like oh this is this is something that I'm needing to survive in this is a scenario where like oh I'm feeling like I'm I'm in my survival state of being yeah, absolutely. And I think when we talk about, you know, reading energy, um, in my practice, I've actually seen a lot of correlation to between kind of like so, the way that we view somatic therapies, like the way that somatic kind of signs show up in our body mm-hmm. and the way that we kind of look at or describe energy, right. essentially. Um, and, you know, kind of coming from a background of having studied Tantra, and connecting that with somatic therapies, I see so many parallels. You know, when we talk about the chakra system and we talk about blockages in our chakra system and comparing that to the way that we might have like a somatic experience of like tension or a blockage in a part of our body, I think that oftentimes we're using different language to describe what is essentially the same thing. Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't really know what somatic means, how would you just sort of briefly describe that to someone? Um, Sure. Yeah. So when we're referring to somatic modalities, we're really referring to connecting the mind to the body. mm -hmm. So really looking at it as kind of a holistic equation Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, really viewing ourselves as a kind of cerebral floating head. um, (laughs) (laughs) It's a really great image in my head. <laughs> Getting really curious. Um, yeah, like I said before about those kind of cues from our yeah. body and like really actually beginning to be in conversation with our, what our body has to say. Right. Um, yeah. And so as we were kind of mentioning before, listening to our neuroception, you know, like yeah. listening to those messages that maybe our gut or, you know, our chest are giving us at different times. Mm-hmm. Um, somatic modalities recognize that trauma is stored in the body. Um, so if we experience an event, a traumatic event, for example, in nature, like an antelope, you know, they get chased by a lion. They're going to shake afterwards. They're going to shake. They're going to shake it off. They're going to let it go. Um, but we don't really do that in our culture. So if we experience a traumatic event, we kind of hold it Mm. in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's the somatic modalities really have this theory that, that, um, that event, that memory doesn't really go away unless we, you know, have a chance to process it. Right. Yeah. Um, so it gets stored for later. And, um, you know, this can really manifest in different ways. This can manifest as chronic tension that we mm. hold on into, uh, we hold on to in the body. So this can manifest as, so if we're experiencing enough chronic stress over time, chronic tension, digestive issues, things that really get held on to. And so every time we, you know, we have um, an event that reminds us of this trauma, our body will kind of go back into that response. Right. So one of the ways in which we actually begin to uh, heal trauma is by going into the body Mm -hmm. and allow, giving the body the opportunity to slowly begin to like process or unwind the event. And this can happen through, movement this can happen through sound this can Mm. happen simply by really really feeling like our physical selves yeah 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 I really like that it's um it's interesting because I think there's a maybe some bias around trauma being a certain type of experience and maybe sometimes people pin it as something that's more it can show up in extreme cases but sometimes it's only seen as that extreme event that happened like Oh, that big car impact or like that, uh, that may be an abusive relationship, but trauma can also come in these other microaggressions or like these built up tensions over time that are kind of like perpetuating and being stuck in our cells and in our body and in our muscles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I um, like chronic stress can have very similar effects on the body. And so whether there's like trauma with a capital T or with a little t, they both have an impact on the way that our nervous system functions over time. And the thing about the way that we're kind of functioning in our society today 
is that like we're we have a lot of events that will kind of consistently put us on edge. So there's a lot of chronic stress, mm -hmm. and people are oftentimes experiencing like a lot of that chronic tension mm -hmm. that I mentioned before, and this really has an impact on the way that we experience our sexuality and our sexual health. Right. Um, because we're in a, when we're in a constant state of feeling like on the alert, mm. um, our diaphragms will kind of become frozen and constricted over time. So we, we stop breathing properly. We start breathing like into our, our chest, chest as a yeah. way to kind of like protect our bodies. You know, we're kind of anticipating that something is going to happen. And so our mm. breathing patterns really change. So obviously our blood is not becoming oxygenated properly. And this can lead to a lot of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. um, also our diaphragm, so our diaphragm muscle, which is made to kind of uh, come downwards, you know, underneath our ribs with our inhale. So, you know, creating more room in our chest cavity. Um, this can become like kind of chronically frozen and weak over time from not being used properly. Our pelvic bowl, which is actually designed to expand and contract with every breath. So if we're not breathing properly, this can also become really rigid and frozen over time. And this is where we begin to um, actually see a lot of uh, challenges show up in and around our sexuality as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, men experiencing challenges around, you know, keeping and maintaining an erection. You know, a lot of the time that can have to do with restricted blood flow and pelvic tension. Or for women, I see a lot an experience of not really being able to experience pleasure mm -hmm. as well from, um, from chronic pelvic tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how these sort of almost like outer experiences or external pieces are so linked to the more core aspects or the foundational pieces of our body and, and our being how they sort of like ripple into each of the layers and affect the way that we that navigate other aspects of our life, like our sexuality. Mm. Yeah. The more that I study this stuff, the more I see that everything is connected. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I start here, I start unraveling this one thread around, you know, somatic, um, somatic therapy or Tantra, and it connects to this other thread. And it's like, it's yeah. really like our emotional well-being and our physical health. They're so intricately connected. Yeah, and you can't take care of one without taking care of the other. Yeah, totally. You mentioned um, before around how sound, breath, and movement are sort of some of the, the foundational pieces around somatic therapies or I guess somatic sex education that are able to help heal and transform or I guess like melt away traumas in the body and I'm curious I think maybe like sound and movement might be a little like in my personal practice around some of the clients that I've come have come in like sound and movement in particular are really abstract concepts to invite into one's experience around body work and how that really transforms or either creates a different experience within the container so I'm curious on maybe if some examples or some like processes that you've noticed that have shifted in a more empowering way by inviting in more sound and, and movement within a somatic container and maybe like some of the challenges that you see within that or maybe some of the challenges that you've noticed within the, those containers and how mm. like those three pieces kind of weave in and make it a different experience for people. Sure, yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Um, first off, I want to say that, yeah, I, I hear you. Like a lot of people, you tell them to invite them to breathe or to make sound and they look at you and they're like, what? Like, like you know, like <laughs> we're, we're so used to being like chronically frozen that, you know, taking a full breath can sometimes feel really difficult. It can feel really challenging. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, the diaphragm can become really weak and chronically frozen. So even just taking that full breath, we're, we're often stretching muscles that maybe haven't been used in a long time. And you know, a lot of people too will also have like a little bit of a natural resistance too. You know, when you start kind of connecting um, their sexuality to pieces that they might associate with being more like uh, connected to something like yoga, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, there might be like a little bit of pushback that sometimes comes. Um, and I think a big piece of that too, because you were mentioning the voice, people mm -hmm. have a lot of innate shame around their voices and making sound. Mm -hmm. 
for everyone. And so when I'm in a bodywork container with someone and I invite them to make sound, it can sometimes be really challenging for them. Mm -hmm. um, but as they open to the idea, it's an incredibly empowering experience. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'd say the two things that we, we, in our bodies, that we have the biggest shame barriers around are our sexuality and our voice. Mm -hmm. And they're also the two things that, um, that can like really have this magical ability to connect us back to ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, a big part of my embodiment journey has actually been exploring, you know, exploring singing and opening my voice through that channel. And wow, it's so like, it's, it's taught me so much because when I'm, um, when I'm toning or when I'm singing, I can actually, through how clear my voice is coming out, it gives me a direct insight to how much tension I'm holding in my body. Mm, yeah, interesting. And um, when we're toning, so if we're, if we're making sound, you might hear people kind of like oming, or you might people hear people making like an kind of breathing out and making it ha. Uh, just gonna do that right now. How about we just, how about we just invite <laughs> that right now into the space? I'm like, I'm gonna feel that relaxation <laughs> in my pelvis. Hold on. All right. Uh, uh, so when we do that. Yeah. When we, when we sound, we're actually also, um, we're vibrating the vagus nerve. Oh, so yeah. We're also, and at the same time, we're creating breath control. So as I'm focusing on that long, long exhale, I'm creating breath control, which is relaxing my nervous system, and I'm stimulating the vagus nerve. So this has actually been shown to, over time, create like more resilience in the way that we reg that we regulate ourselves. Yeah. So there's there's so much richness in having a vocal practice and in having a breath practice. When clients um, have our are kind of meeting that yeah. meeting maybe a little bit of fear mm -hmm. or meeting a little bit of um, resistance, I really just invite them to be in their learning zone. There's never there's never any pressure to go somewhere that you don't want to go in a mm -hmm. session. Like the mm -hmm. session is you know, it's for you. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of stretch just a little bit, you know, into something that might feel new or something that might feel just a little bit uncomfortable, that's where we really have an opportunity to invite in like deeper learning. Yeah, totally. Totally. You were mentioning around some of the shame and challenges that come up with certain clients. And I'm curious on what are some of the biggest challenges that you've noticed within your personal practice or some of like that you've noticed that people have? Mm, yeah. Well, we talked a lot about safety. And yeah. so like helping people to just feel safe is a big, is a big piece. Um, and as we get more into actually like getting to the roots of like embodied sex education, I'd say that like it really kind of uh, people with like male bodies and female bodies, you know, might experience challenges that are slightly different. Right. Okay. Um, for a lot of the people with male bodies who have come to work with me, you know, like the biggest question on their mind is usually like, okay, like, you know, how can I last longer? Mm. You know? Is that, that like, um, that's like the, the usual question that comes through? That is like, that is typically the number, the number one. one question. Yeah. Really? Or they might have erectile challenges, but right. most mm -hmm. men, you know, come when they come in, they're like, okay, like, you know, I, I've heard about Tantra, like I want to last longer. Yeah. <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> Which is, you know, it's a legitimate question. They're wanting to understand yeah. more about their bodies. Um, for a lot of men, they've never really received any kind of embodied sex education. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that feels like very much out of their control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, a lot, um, and we talked a little bit about pelvic tension and yeah. we talked a little bit about like regulation, like nervous system regulation. So really that does play a huge part. Yeah. Um, breath plays a huge part. Yeah. you know, and, um, yeah. So when I'm working with men, that's kind of where we'll start. Yeah. And then there are like other techniques that you can use to build on that, like really building, um, strength in the pelvic floor can be really helpful. Yeah. But like the number one tool is like affecting how you work with your breath yeah. and like really noticing where your point of no return is too, like developing right. an awareness of that too. Right. So you can, 
you know, um, yeah, so that you can just have an awareness of that and know when to pause. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of people don't really understand the concept or have a, have an awareness around maybe what an 80% arousal, like heightened state is for themselves personally. Like they're like, they may not know what their point of no return is. And it's really great how in, in the way that we build an embodied practice around our awareness and around the way that our sexuality functions in our body we're able to, and to like train the nervous system, train the body and train our patterns within the body to enhance and have more of the experiences that we are intentionally wanting to experience like within our sexuality. Absolutely. Like it's, it's all about developing awareness, you know? So as we're creating more of that connection to our bodies, you know, noticing that when we're at our 80% is going to become much easier. Yeah. And, you know, there are also practices that kind of um, come from Tantra or Taoist sexuality where they really talk about um, taking erotic energy and circulating it too. Mm -hmm. So erotic energy is no longer just something that we're experiencing just in our genitals, mm -hmm. but something that we can actually move through our whole body. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you're, um, instead of having this like little tiny container to hold your erotic energy, <laughs> you're, you're really like increasing your capacity. Yeah. to be able to, to hold it. So that is incredibly helpful as well. Yeah, totally. And um, when I work with people with female bodies, um, some of the biggest challenges that they often experience are understanding how to map their pleasure, for mm. starters, yeah. and then communicate that then to their partners. Right, having that voice and the, and the pelvis connected, that central connection again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a big yeah. part of that is like really understanding how their, you know, how their bodies and how their sexuality uh, work, you know, what feels good mm -hmm. for them. And it's going to be different for each of us. Like we're all shaped differently. Mm -hmm. uh, we all kind of, um, women will have like a huge range when it comes to how they experience orgasm, how quickly they experience orgasm, mm -hmm. um, how sensitive they are. So like really mm -hmm. learning, learning one's body. Yeah. Um, and, um, a lot of women will also experience pain or numbness during sex right. too. So, you know, really kind of beginning to, um, learn how to navigate that, uh, tools that women could kind of develop for, you know, creating more sensation in mm. around the yoni, like giving her space to like actually open fully, giving her space to become fully engorged before she invites penetration yeah. or like really doing like de armoring work. Cause sometimes that like mm. chronic tension, as I've mentioned before, can really impact the way that we experience pleasure. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I'm sure like some people when they come in for a session, they have these intentions or these ideas of what they are thinking that they're needing. But then ultimately, sometimes there might be an unfolding that happens where they might end up actually noticing a layer underneath that that's completely different than what they were that they thought they were coming in for. So for example, if a, if a, a male bodied person was to come in, and they're like, I want to last longer, but then ultimately, like the the core issue underneath that, or maybe even a tension that's underneath that is like a feeling of wanting more safety and connection and intimacy in their lives. Or like for women, like maybe they want to experience more confidence or pleasure in the way that, and the way that they can clearly communicate that to their partners. But then ultimately maybe sometimes underneath that in their bodies, like their body just needs to feel more relaxation or like, attune into the sensations that are there and coming into more acceptance around the body and the body's way of navigating intimacy and sexuality. Yeah, absolutely. And I find that the sessions like always have a way of just kind of flowing into what people really need, you know, like people will kind of like map out people's intentions before we work together. And, um, you know, and that'll kind of give me uh, cues as to like where I can kind of focus on giving people like educational pieces. Yeah. But then at the end of the day, yeah, it's like um, there's really a way of just kind of uh, flowing into like, okay, what is the body? What does yeah. the body really need? And kind of finding that that pace yeah. that meets it. Yeah, yeah. I can totally see why how um, embodied sex education can feel so beneficial for lots of people and lots of different aspects of our lives and the way that we are able to connect with ourselves relationally 
and with the people around us and the world around us. It's, it just seems like such a valuable practice. I think, um, yeah, I think that people are really waking up to what a powerful practice this is. Yeah, definitely. And that feels really good because, you know, I've been kind of working in and around the realms of sex education um, and, you know, and touch work for the last eight years. And it's, it's mostly been in the last couple of years that I've been like, having more and more conversations with people where I'm really seeing like, I'm just seeing um, this enthusiasm in the community mm. for embodied sex education. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. really lighting me up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So what are, what would you say would be the number, like maybe the number one thing that people could do on a daily practice um, that would allow them to have a more of an embodied education around their sexuality that they could just invite daily? themselves mm. yeah okay I mean foundationally like something that I've been getting people to do uh has been to look at how they're breathing mm. you know and to like really um work on like you know breathing from the diaphragm and allowing that you know like breathing into the pelvic bowl with every breath mm. and we can kind of diaphragmatic breathing we can kind of do uh by lying on our back Mm -hmm. And, you know, pushing, pushing our stomach out mm. with every breath. So, you know, feet flat on the ground and putting your hand over your belly and pushing your stomach out with every breath. Because as your diaphragm, um, well, it, it contracts as it moves downwards. So it's actually going to push your belly out with every breath. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we're going to create a little bit of a, different, a difference in the way that we breathe and the way that we feel in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, if we're talking about, you know, bringing in a piece, you know, to our sexuality, um, you know, developing an embodied self-pleasure practice is always a really amazing, amazing thing to start with. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree there on that one. <laughs> you know me <laughs> when it comes to self-pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that can, you know, that can look at, you know, like, I mean, the way that we've touched our bodies over time can become very habitual, it can become very rigid. So actually, like, you know, getting curious, again, and approaching our bodies, like from a place of curiosity. So, you know, like, how can I touch my skin in a way that feels sensual? Like, how can I like really embrace my sensuality from the inside? Yeah. And when I begin to do, um, you know, work with people around uh, building their relationship with their inner lover. Like this is mm. like really a place where we start. Yeah, definitely. Um, that could be a yeah. whole other ep like. That could be a whole. Other episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you can put on music. You can, you know, you can get out the lube. You can get a toy. You can dance around. You can dance naked in your room. You can yeah. touch yourself. You can get a mirror and get like curious. Okay, like what do my yeah. genitals look like? Yeah. Um, you know, how can I develop a more loving relationship with them? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes even like inviting new experiences allows us to take a deeper look at maybe some things that we might feel shame around or self-critique or inner judgment around within our the way that we show up in our sexuality so it's such a beautiful like learning edge or learning space to dive into like becoming your own best lover into a self-pleasure practice because then you're able to be like oh that's showing up in this moment what what am I making that to mean about myself like oh is there a way that I can feel like what do I really need now in this moment that's going to allow me to feel more of what I want to feel in my desires in the way that I want to show up for myself and for others. So it's really, yeah, I just, I love that, especially with the mirror practice. When you mentioned the mirror, I'm like, yeah, I remember the first times I had a self-pleasure practice in front of a mirror. It was an, it was an interesting experience. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of my judgments or shadows came up for sure. And that one, it took me a while to get used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, self lovership has been a really big part of my healing journey for mm -hmm. sure, and like really like allowing that to kind of um, ripple outwards into like in, into the way that we live our lives. You yeah, know? how would I live my life if I were treating myself like a beloved? Essentially. Yeah. Oh gosh, I love that. I love that. I love that. If I was treating myself like a beloved, how would I show up? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I love that feeling. It like just sensationally in my cell, I could just feel mm -hmm. like this like melty 
liquid love just like pouring through my cells as I was listening to you say that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, this has been such an amazing conversation and I'm so looking forward to sh sharing more and having more conversations late, um, later with you. Like you're just so awesome. I'm oh, curious. Thank you. Yeah. I'm curious on where, where people would find you, what sort of things that you're doing right now that maybe might interest people or that you want to let people know about. Cool. Yeah. So I have a private practice in Victoria um, I also do uh, online coaching as well with people. Um, some e-courses are in the works, so stay tuned for those. Um, people can find me on Instagram, Body Beloved, Facebook, Body Beloved, um, or bodybeloved.ca if they want to look me up on the web. Beautiful. Amazing. Mm. Oh, I'm so excited for those e-courses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. It's, do you um, have anything juicy? topics that you have like that you're going to be creating first or that you know of yet or are you still that still in the work a lot of the stuff that we talked about today okay. yeah so yeah. like really really like how do we create safety in the body how do we ask for what we want mm -hmm. and then like what does embodied sex education look like yeah beautiful mm -hmm. oh my gosh well i am so stoked for that to come out and we'll just add your website and um, other details in the description below if anyone wants to check it out as well um, and yeah I am so grateful to have had you in this beautiful space that we got to share together today that we got such to share a, today <laughs> such a pleasure thank you for having me on yeah. listen so much love bye